Good morning, everyone. There we go. So network automation forum, by the way, uh, Scott didn't say, is what, November 13th and 14th in Denver? So if you got the ability to get budget from your employer and travel over that way, it's gonna be two days worth of network automation related talks. So another plug for it. Hopefully I'll see you there. Excellent, so I'm going to go ahead and talk here this morning a bit about how do you do uh, labbing of, of these networking devices, but more specifically here about uh, ability to do labs as code. And the journey I've been on a bit along the way of trying to figure out what are all the options available, how useful are these. And my talk's gonna cover a few concepts here first. And then I'm gonna hand it over to Jared, who's gonna talk about, so I'll start off with the theory. Jared's gonna actually jump into the practical implementation of this and walk you through Container Lab along the way. So hopefully, let's see if this works now. It does. Uh, in the interest of trying to do this as code, so you can't quite see, because I can't share the screen here from my laptop, but highly recommend if you hate PowerPoint as much as I do, you can do markdown files in VS Code. All of my slides are just markdown and it instantly exports it into PowerPoint. Uh, so highly recommended way of avoiding having to use PowerPoint in the future and uh, check all your, your slides into a Git repo. <clears throat> okay, what I'm curious about is who's here in the room. So I wanna ask a few questions here. First, so by way of hands, who's a network engineer? Okay, uh, who'd consider themselves a developer? Interesting, okay. And now, either with zero hands raised, one hand raised, or two hands raised, how much auto network automation are you doing at your current employer? So none, some, or a lot? And given this is a room of people interested in network automation, this is kind of interesting, right? We see the kind of spectrum here of people going from essentially very little or a few little scripts to we're somewhere on the journey to people probably doing more advanced and it seemed like it was kind of an even split between those three. All right, now um, also, uh, so who is, who's in this room is doing this as grassroots automation as opposed to uh, the other side of this, which is you've got full company support and you're on a separate team with separate budget and all of that. So who's doing this as kind of grassroots organization? Okay. Uh, and then uh, from the other side, how many of you actually have real management buy-in to your automation efforts? Now, keep your hands up. Right? Uh, how many of you actually really have management buy-in? In other words, <laughs> you're not involved in firefighting anymore, you're not involved in escalations, right? A few hands went down there. All right, so very few of you actually are, like let's say dedicated to doing network automation um, full time. Uh, and then finally, uh, so kind of three options here. How many people are doing artisanal coding, right? So writing your own Python scripts versus, uh, so the other one would be if you're using frameworks like Ansible or something like that. How many is using Ansible for their automation? Okay. Um, and then how many of you are using commercial tools anywhere along the way here, right? Um, okay. This is similar to what I saw elsewhere. All right, let's go ahead then talk here a bit about this. Um, very quick intro, uh, I'm Pete Crocker. I currently work for IP Fabric. Uh, I've got a long background going way back to doing, anybody know what that box is there? Uh, this tells you how old I am. <laughs> there we go, <laughs> right? So way before Linux, my student assistant at that time came to me and said, we should do this all with Linux, and I laughed at him, right? Because it was compile your old kernel days of, of Linux, and there was no way we could actually run business on, on Linux at that point. Uh, anyways, I've been doing networking for, uh, I don't know, 20-something years now. Uh, started off doing this at uh, one of the original service providers in the US that ultimately is now a part of AT&T's backbone. And, 
then what we're going to talk about here today is why do network simulations and what are the different approaches to doing simulations, right? So ultimately, if you boil this down, what this, what this comes to is you've got two competing priorities, right? Your company, your business, your organization is wanting you to make changes faster, right? They don't want to wait weeks for a VLAN to be added to be able to spin up a server, right? So they want change faster. At the same time, doing things faster often introduces more risk, right? So we're talking about simulations here as a method to try and reduce the amount of risk for changes so that you can hopefully respond to the needs of your organization here faster. That's the intended idea behind this. So what's one of the ways that you can do this? How many people here have a nice long multi-page mop type document, right? Method of procedures, change control document, whatever you wanna call this. This is the way that we've done this for 20 years, right? And the MOP, essentially what it's trying to do is de-risk changes. Uh, in reality, what it is, is it's a document of all of the stupid mistakes you've made in the past, but it's never really a predictor of what are the future mistakes you're going to make. Uh, so it just ends up being a way to cover yourself uh, as you're making changes that if you follow it according to this mop procedure, then nobody can point the finger at you when things go sideways because at least you've got a back out plan, right? But it doesn't end up really giving you much confidence that is a change going to actually do what you want and is it going to have any unintended consequences along the way? So let's go ahead and talk about other ways that you can do this, right? So we'll start off here with Simulation and emulation. So simulation really simply is you're just creating an abstract model of the network, right? And it really is kind of an abstract model there that I'll talk about here in a little bit of detail. But that abstract model is it's no longer OSPF, it's no longer a Cisco or Arista box or anything like that. It is, I have a bunch of devices, this is how their packets are forwarding through each of these devices, but it's abstracted away from any of the vent, you know, specific protocols or underlying vendors representing it. As opposed to emulation, which is typically is the approach of, I'm going to get a VM from one of the vendors, I'm going to spin up that VM, and that VM is acting as some type of representation of the physical hardware that I'm usually deploying in that environment. And we need to talk through simulation and emulation now and talk about what are some of the challenges. Uh, first bit here though is, let's go ahead and give some examples. So when you talk about simulation, uh, I've had a long history of working with all kinds of tools in this space. Most of these are commercial tools. There is almost zero open source simulation tools out there, right, as opposed to emulators, which we'll talk about here in a minute. Um, the, one of the exceptions, of course, is Batfish, uh, still an open source method of doing this, right? But these tools then, let's go ahead and talk a little bit about the pros and cons of using these, right? So one thing they're really good at is that you can do detailed models of network state, right? How is each device going to end up actually forwarding the traffic through it? And they also can usually do layer two and layer four type behavior, right? So, how is spanning tree going to behave? How is NAT or stateful firewall rules going to behave? How is PBR going to behave uh, as a packet progresses here through the network? And these tools typically scale well, right? So you can get tens of thousands of devices, right? So you can create a model of your entire environment and use that model then to, to get an understanding of, of how does the network actually behave end to end. So they're really good from that standpoint of understanding the entire scope of the network, all of the devices involved, modeling the most common behavior on all those devices. However, uh, there's a few challenges with this, right? Um, first off, it is an abstract model, right? It's not going to tell you what happens in an Arista box specifically, right? So you're abstracting away any of the vendor specifics when you end up using these approaches. Uh, the, one of the other challenges is each of those tools has to learn how to interpret the specific config statements 
or state output from each of those vendors. So if you want to model Aruba, then you've got to understand every version of Aruba's output uh, in order to create that type of model. So there's a huge amount of work that needs to be done for the, the various simulation tools to support every single variant of every single box out there in your network. And I'll tell you from living in this world, right, everyone still has ancient you know, catalyst switches running around, uh, and there's pic plenty of PIX firewalls and net screens and all kinds of boxes that have been end of life for about 15 years, and you need to model all of those because those are still deployed in everyone's environments, right? Those boxes never go away. And the problem is, if your vendor's not supported, then you can't create a full end-to-end -end model of your environment. So there's challenges with the simulation approach. Now let's go ahead and switch on over and talk here about emulators. So we started way back when with, if any people even remember this, about what Dynamips was and why it was even called that, right? So Dynamips was essentially trying to emulate the original Cisco ASICs inside of the boxes. And since then you have GNS3, uh, probably many of you use GNS3 or EVE for doing your labbing or for doing all your certifications, spinning up all those environments, and they're fine in small scale. But what we're interested in talking about here, right, is trying to do labbing as code, right? So how can we go and spin up a section of your network, uh, repeatedly spin it up in a CI pipeline, do testing on it, uh, and then just destroying that afterwards. And those types of tools, right, GNS3, Eve, they're not well suited to that type of workflow. So that brings in this whole new generation of tools. So one of them is Vagrant. So this comes more from the server side of the world here for people that are doing uh, um, app development. Uh, but Vagrant has been extended to be able to do network uh, emulation and spin up vendor VMs. And then what Jared's gonna talk about here is Container Lab, which makes this even simpler. Uh, and then the third one I'll mention here is uh, there's an open source project called NetLab, and you can think of NetLab as it's an orchestrator on top of either Vagrant or Container Lab. Uh, and its point in life is what do you do after you've spun up the network? How do you push out your configurations and how do you make it really simple to just say, turn BGP on everywhere, regardless of what the vendor is. So NetLab is the kind of the layer on top to make it easy to do uh, repeatable configurations in a multi-vendor space. All right, so what are the problems with emulators? There's a few things really here that you need to be aware of. Um, they are first, they're great at, you can test out your config changes. Right? You can say, what happens if I bring down an interface? How is the network going to behave in those cases? So you can test out, if you still have to do a, a mop style document for each one of your changes, you can end up actually testing the order of those changes. That's very relevant on some vendors where you end up having to apply a specific command in a specific order. And then you also need to test what's your back out procedure, right? Which your back out procedure, what is the order of operations that you need to make those changes in? So it's great from that standpoint, right? It's the emulation of each of your vendors. You can jump on the command line, test these things out. Um, what it's also good for is of course automation, right? You wanna try your Python Nornier code, you wanna run your Ansible playbooks, uh, then you can actually test and make sure that that it's actually going to work on that lab environment before you actually roll it out into production. That uh, you can typically do layer two and layer four behavior on them, but there's some gotchas around on that, which I'll talk about. Uh, but let's talk about some of the cons around this. So first is actually getting VMs from all your vendors. Uh, not everyone even publishes them. Right, if you wanna, this is fine if you're talking about some of the mainstream router vendors, right? Uh, but the, you start getting further afield and you wanna start talking about you know, SD-WAN and load balancers and much less trying to, to do you know, wireless or anything like that, then you're gonna really struggle to actually get meaningful VMs that actually behave somewhat like the production systems. Uh, 
The other thing is there's some gotchas on these. Many of the hardware devices we work with, they do the layer two behavior inside of the ASICs on those devices. And then they end up trying to write code for the VMs that pretends to do layer two behavior. And there's all kinds of gotchas around that. So just be aware of kind of for your specific vendor's VM, what are the limits about what it can actually do? And just understand that you, know, you won't really be testing certain layer two changes in a lab. You're just gonna kind of pretend to do some of those. Uh, next one is cost. A lot of the vendors still charge you for those VMs and they have really annoying licensing models that are not well suited to try and spinning this up in a CI pipeline. So if there's anyone from Fortinet here, I want to talk. Um, you cannot apply the license through an API call. You have to actually log into a GUI and drag and drop in a license file, which means that you cannot really effectively just spin up certain VMs apply the license, do whatever labbing you want to do in a CI pipeline and tear it all down again, right? So just be aware that you've got to you know, push your vendors here that if you're going down this path of automation that they need to make automation friendly and consumable VMs for you to do some of this. Uh, there also can be very high requirements. And so this kind of goes to the question here of cost, right? Cost isn't just the VM license, it's, it's how much time do you need to spend actually maintaining this lab? And how much CPU memory do you need to slap at trying to actually create a sizable enough network for this? So you wanna take uh, you know, some of the boxes that typically would be like backbone routers for many of your environment. Each one of those takes about eight gigs of memory. And very quickly, right, so oftentimes what I see certainly in the enterprise space is that if you have to go to your team and ask for a, a server that has more than about 128 gigs of memory, then you start getting into dangerous territory, right? It's no longer, yeah, I can spin it up tomorrow. It's great, put in a purchase request. Uh, it'll take us two months to actually get you a server to do that. So you, you have a problem here really with scale of how many VMs can you actually spin up on a single server? Can you get enough CPU and memory horsepower to actually do a, a meaningful lab of your data center or part of your network? Uh, and then finally, and not least, is how the VMs work is typically different than how the hardware works. And this creates a lot of annoyances, right? Uh, what I mean here is uh, some of the VMs are limited to eight interfaces, but your switch has 24 ports. So you can't actually create a one-to-one -one model of this data center switch and that's in production and what you want to spin up in the lab. The other one is, is they oftentimes change the interface names, right? So if you want to try and create, again, a one-to-one -one model between your data center and the actual uh, uh, the VMs that you're going to spin up in a lab, one box calls it Giggy Zero, the VM wants to call it Ethernet One, for example. Uh, I, I won't point out vendors' names for that one that would uh, love to try and get some of that stuff fixed. Uh, but it ends up creating this challenge that you end up having this translation table, right? Reality versus what you can actually spin up here in a lab. Uh, and that also is a, an amount of effort. And if you don't end up maintaining those things properly, then you get back to this you know, handcraft, handcrafted artisanal lab that isn't actually representative of, of the reality. And you trying to keep those two things in sync ends up being a fair bit of a problem. Okay, so finally, uh, uh, I'm gonna sum it on up and I'll hand over to Jared here in just a second. Uh, there's essentially three approaches you can take out here around on this, right? So one is take, taking the configurations from your devices and uh, creating a model from that. Probably the most common uh, way I see this right now is people use Batfish for doing this. So it's got its limitations of what you can do from a simulation standpoint, but it's a great open source project that you can get in and actually end up doing certain cases uh, and can do them quite well. Uh, the second one here really is going and learning all of the state in the environment, right? So routing table information, spanning tree information, all the configs from the devices. 
the challenge of those simulation tools is that you can't really do pre-change validation. So I can't end up saying what happens if I put in another device or what happens if I make a BGP change and how does that propagate on out. Those tools can't end up simulating future state uh, because they don't end up actually being able to model how every single box will behave. And then the third option here is emulation. This is the one that's probably best fit for doing a lot of the CI testing uh, that you may want to do of trying to spin up a one-to-one -one relationship between a part of your network. And that's where I'll hand it over to Jared is to show you how do you actually do that in reality. Great, thank you. Jared. Is there a clicker? Sweet. All right, thanks. Well, I just want to start quickly by saying uh, my name is Jared Gerth. I work with Nokia. I'm part of a business development team or a technical evangelist team uh, for data center networks. And uh, I think we'll talk a little bit later about some of the things that Nokia does. But we've been happy to work with NetBox uh, in the Net DevOps days, both in London and here uh, in New York City. So um, let me start by just asking how many folks are familiar with Container Lab? Pretty good amount, maybe about half or so. So uh, for you folks, some of this might be a review, but I think I've got at least one new thing for you. Um, for others, uh, I, I hope this is, is a, a beneficial uh, talk for you. I think in the way that Pete talked about, um, wow, look at that. Um, in the way that Pete talked about um, the setup, kind of the theory for network labs, we started this, this tool called Container Lab to really uh, scratch an itch that we had internally. Uh, in Nokia, about a little over five years ago, we started a development project for a new network operating system, Linux-based, and from the start, we packaged it as a container for our own individual use. So getting one container, piece of cake, right? That's easy to do. But if I wanna have multiple containers and have them talk to each other, how do I do that, right? And so this tool was kind of born out of that. And we've used it internally for, for learning. Um, and now the number of use cases that we've used now, or, or the, that we have for it now, it just continues to grow. As Pete mentioned, it's a way to validate designs, test your control plane. And I'll talk a little bit about some of the interesting things that we can do with it in CICD frameworks. But, um, Another key tenant for us was to do this as code, right? So if we're dealing with Docker containers already, uh, it makes sense to, uh, to have a tool that we can manage the same way you'd manage your Docker containers. So think of Container Lab as a tool, uh, sort of like Docker Compose for network labs. Uh, this is something that we've put into, into the open source, so it's, a, it's um, Develop, primary developers are Nokia folks, but it's a free open source tool. It's multi-vendor, so I'll talk a little bit about that uh, later on. And we have contributions from really all of the major network vendors uh, for their um, NOSs into this framework. Uh, so doing this as code meant we wanted to put it into Git from the very start. And so that means we can collaborate, we can do all of our versioning, and then we can easily do sharing. So what we wanted to do is we wanted to take that same approach, uh, like I said, that uh, the Docker Compose gave us into a network lab. So we start with uh, kind of a declarative YAML file to build out your network, right? So it's, it's easy to read, right? It's easy to version. Uh, Container Lab then takes that, uh, that input, that topology file, and builds that network for you uh, in, a, in a number of containers uh, and links them all together talk about that a little bit more. So the basic workflow here for Container Lab is, go ahead, you, you do this on a Linux machine. Uh, you can do it on uh, the, the Linux subsystem in Windows, working through some issues on uh, M2 and M1 Macs with uh, the transition to ARM. But you can just do it on any, any Linux VM that's got uh, Docker on it. Install the Container Lab binary grab your, your definition files uh, out, of, uh, out of Git and uh, deploy your lab. Then you can interact with it, and you can do that 
you know, hands on the keyboard, or you could do that systematically with uh, automation frameworks, right? And this is where a tool like Net, uh, NetLab would come into play here that you could layer on top of Container Lab to, do, to interact and to configure your topology. And then you can go about sharing these. Uh, one interesting use case here is we actually uh, worked with a customer in Europe uh, over the summer here that did all of their proof of concept. They're a new Nokia customer, but did all of their proof of concept through a Git repository and our, our community on Discord. Right, so they would, they would do their revisions. Uh, some of our folks would help and contribute and, and uh, do uh, pull requests against that repository for changes. And they had a way to programmatically go through a proof of concept uh, using these tools. Uh, so installing it, I think you can kind of see that, hopefully. It's just a simple, um, simple bash command in a curl. Um, to go and grab this, it's a Go binary, and install it on your Linux system. So very simple and straightforward. Um, what you're then going to do, your topology file, um, you're going to start with node definition. So your nodes are going to be the instances that you're testing. Here, I've called out SRL or SR Linux. It's the Nokia uh, network operating system for... Um, uh, for data center, basically. And what we've done with our image from the get-go, which Pete kind of just uh, talked to some of his frustrations about, was we decided to make our container version of this, our container image, freely available. So you can it's in the GitHub container registry, and you can pull that container down, and then you can set a chassis type here. So you could do any of the different models, from the pizza boxes to, uh, to even a chassis, and get your appropriate line card numbering, uh, port numbering, etc. Um, but if you want other container images, how would you go about doing that? So this is a basic framework for that. Obviously, the SR Linux one, very easy to grab. If you've got a container image from another vendor, as long as you have access to that image, you can point your topology file to that container, and it gets pulled right into your uh, topology. Uh, SROS is an example. It's a Nokia operating system, but it's an example of a NOS that's not natively containerized. And there are still a large number of these. Um, we, there's a tool uh, that uh, one of our developers uh, forked uh, on GitHub called VR NetLab, and it's a way of taking VM-based NOSes and managing them in a container framework. So you can grab that project and uh, then get your resulting container image uh, for your topology file. And there's a bunch of those that are pre-built already and available for use, obviously. For anything that requires a license, you got to go through that process. So it's, it's a little bit cumbersome at times, but lots of folks are doing it. Uh, and here's just a, a quick sample of, of uh, the various container uh, NOSes that are available today. Uh, you can see Nokia, Juniper, Arista, Cisco, NVIDIA. You've even got some stuff from, from Ixia in a container as well and more coming. So there's, if you go to, to the Container Lab website, you'll see there is, um, there are some labs built with just plain FRR. Or if you want to run Sonic, there are container images for those as well, and you can then put together a topology that is truly multi-vendor. Um, and another cool thing you can do is, really because we're just orchestrating and connecting containers together, uh, is you can pull in other systems that are are relevant to your topology. So let's say um, uh, some of the examples we do are, it would be a container lab topology that deploys a telemetry lab. So as a part of that telemetry lab, you've got a TIG stack, for, in, for instance, for gathering streaming telemetry, displaying it in a Grafana dashboard. Um, Netbox is a great tool here that you can use as well, right? You can spin that up as a container within your topology, and you can use orchestration tools on top of that to query Netbox, populate Netbox, do, do some testing uh, against that or any number of these, these tools here. And this is a bit more uh, about just uh, anything that is not a native container this is this VR NetLab tool here is the way that you can put that into a wrapper and container, basically containerize it or control it as a container as a part of your topology. 
So we covered a little bit about the um, the containers themselves, the nodes that you would have in your topology. The real you know, tricky part here, I guess, in essence, is how do you network them together? Pretty easy to put a management interface onto one of the Docker bridges and get access to it that way, but how do you connect instance to instance? And that's what's defined here under the links section of the, of the YAML file. And in your endpoints, you specify the interface for each of your nodes that you want to connect together, and you get this logical topology view that you see on the right side. So what's resulting there is two containers connected together over a single interface. And then obviously you could expand this out and do a multi-stage clause topology or really any sort of arbitrary topology you might want to define. You can do that using your uh, nodes and then links and endpoints. Uh, so this just a bit more of the topology file that brings together your your nodes. So you, the kind here, where you would find that image file, you can see an instance here of a license. For this node, we do require a license, so you can specify the license file where to find that, and Container Lab will uh, will apply that to the appropriate uh, endpoint. I'm sorry, to the appropriate node, and then you put your your endpoints together. So this is a quick view of deploying a lab. Um, so this you do a deploy command with your YAML file, and then you end up with, at the end, just a nice little printout familiar to anybody that's done uh, container work, right? You've got the name of the various nodes, what image you're using, what kind it is, the state, and the management IP addresses, both v4 and v6. Uh, you can see over on the right-hand side there. This was a lab that we put together to do uh, some sample, uh, a sample peering lab for some IXP customers. So we have, I believe in here, so you, you do have some FRR, you've got one of our routers, and then you've got two route servers. One of them is OpenBGPD, and the other is a bird route server. And so this is uh, another example of different things you can build with Container Lab. So configuring your nodes. You can kind of choose your method here, right? So you could log in once your nodes are deployed. You can log on to the CLI the way you normally would through SSH if you want. Uh, you could even do a Docker ex exec command and jump onto a shell locally if that's if that's how you want to do it. You can use any of your network management APIs. Um, if you want to use uh, supply a config file via a mount, there's a bind option that it binds uh, uh, to a local uh, directory and allows you to slurp in a, a config file that way, or config management tools. We do a number of things here with labs for testing Ansible and Nornir and other tools against uh, various endpoints. And so you could use those third-party tools on top of Container Lab here. And then there is a bit of a config engine built into Container Lab itself. <coughs> And then sharing your labs. Um, so this is as easy as, you know, if you define uh, your lab locally, your various YAML files, etc., you can take those bits and push them up into a Git repository for others to, to clone and to share. And so if you go to the containerlab.dev website, you'll see a number of different labs there that are provided, and you can just go ahead and clone those locally and use those pre-configured files. Um, we set a lot of those up by default to use freely available images. So SR Linux gets used in there, or FRR, or some of the others. If you obviously have another vendor that you want to put into that deployment, you've got to uh, grab that image like we, we said earlier. Uh, we just added a, a new feature in the recent release this past week where you can actually specify the remote URL of your container lab file rather than having it direct. So you can specify the the GitHub or GitLab path, and it'll go grab that and clone it as a part of the deploy step and, and uh, bring all of that, that configuration locally. Uh, so this is a, a, a lab we put together for a, a, a user conference that we put on annually, but it's a, an example of using Container Lab um, to, as a part of your GitHub actions for a CI CD pipeline. Right, so in this particular 
uh, instance, we're configuring a clause topology, and then we're putting some telemetry on top of that, right? So GNMIC is a, a GNMI collector. You've got console for service discovery, and then you've got Prometheus and uh, Grafana for your TSB and, and dashboards. And so we, we build this topology in uh, as a part of the action. The GitHub action looks a bit like this, right? So in that pipeline, you go ahead and you can install Container Lab, you can install that GNMIC tool, deploy your lab, we go through the configuration steps. So what this really does for you at the end of the day is give you an automated way to test changes you've made to the lab. Uh, one of my coworkers who maintains our Napalm driver for SR Linux actually put some of this framework into his uh, automated testing for when he makes changes to the Napalm driver. So anytime he makes those changes, he runs the GitHub uh, action uh, and it goes through that, that uh, series of tests. Fire uses Container Lab to fire up an instance of the NOS and runs those tests that he's defined against the NOS itself. And it's actually bailed him out a couple of times. He was telling me, oh, caught a couple of typos, things like that. So it's a great way to build uh, into your CI CD pipelines the ability to, uh, to emulate network environments. So overall, I think Container Lab is, uh, is a great tool um, to enable you to build, take the theory that we've talked about and put it into practice, into experience, right? Test out those theories, see what happens. Uh, it gives you a way to, uh, to do this in a, in a fast, uh, lightweight, uh, easy uh, framework. So if you haven't already, I would encourage you to take a look at, at the containerlab.dev website. Uh, we do have a Discord community. That QR code there will take you uh, into the Discord community. I think I checked this morning. There were a couple hundred users online uh, currently, and I think we've got over uh, over 500 users totally in the uh, that have joined the Discord server. And then check us out on GitHub as well. You'll see a lot of, of community interaction there. Uh, again, kind of across customers, vendors, it truly is a, a great uh, a community there of, of folks uh, helping one another and sharing ideas. One last thing, and this would be for any of you that are familiar with Container Lab and had known everything that I had just talked through, uh, we started a new project um, to take uh, Container Lab and pair it with Kubernetes to do multi-node labs. And so the guys came up with... Uh, Collabernetes, I think. <laughs> it's memorable, right? Uh, so this is in early alpha state. Uh, you'll see some documentation for it out on the website, and you'll see a channel in the Discord group devoted to folks kind of plunking around on, on Collabernetes and looking to do this across multiple nodes and be able to further emulate larger networks. So that's it. I appreciate the time. I'm happy to take uh, any questions. And actually, if Pete, I don't know where Pete is, but uh, oh, right behind me. Pete's right there. Let's get a round of applause right. for Jared first. Uh, two amazing talks, zero points for Clabonetes in my book. Uh, it seems like if it's coming soon, that means they're still open to name ideas. When I see it, <laughs> it sounds French, Clabelne is what I'm thinking. Yeah. Anywho, uh, questions for Pete or Jarrett? All right, I've got to start it. I've got one. I don't know if you mentioned it, but uh, all right, I see you. Did, it's fully open source, right? Free to use? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay, Absolutely. Good. Hey guys. Oh. Can you guys? Oh, there we yeah, go. There it goes. Okay. I want to say thank you for making all the um, the the VMs, the containers of this mm -hmm. actually like easily available. Yeah. That makes all the difference in the world for being able to test this. Well mm -hmm. done. Thank you. More vendors, please do that. Make the VMs free and just <laughs> instantly available, not hidden behind logins. It's probably a little bit related to what I was going to say, but um, I think Pete mentioned, right, one of the problems with emulation is the misalignment between um, interfaces available for a virtual device versus what you want to be able to, to test against. Um, do you guys have any sort of tricks around, like, maybe how to model around that, or is it is it like maybe if it's Container Lab, use the 
VM, VR, VR in it lab in, instead of like something like COS from Aristo or any tricks? Uh, I'll say two quick things. First, you want to tap the person on the shoulder that's just to your right so that he can get his <laughs> vendor's images to be more CI pipeline friendly. <laughs> um, aside from that, um, no, I just had to write a translation layer for that and okay. essentially a, a, a transform map file that ended up handling the differences between my lab and my production network. Uh, there was no magic. Uh, I wish there was one. Someone please write one. So uh, I'll offer one, I wouldn't call it, uh, well, so what we've done is we've published all of our Yang models, right? So you can see all of our Yang models and you can see, you can walk that, that tree and see exactly how the interfaces are named. And then in, we've documented those Yang files as well. Uh, so, and then that, that uh, for us, the type allows you to then pick which form factor and we then fully do rep represent the interfaces um, in Container Lab the same way that you would have on a physical device. Okay. So I think more transparency around Yang models would help here tremendously in terms of just overall automation, not just interfaces. Which is the easy part, right? Yeah. <laughs> Can I sneak in one more? For yeah. Container Lab, is there a way to run it without sudo? Just from um, the InfoSex people? Yes, so it's a good question. I, I know it's been talked about. I think we still, um, still run it as root, um, but I, I, I know it's something that's come up several times. So I'll check with some of the developer folks and see what the, what the current uh, thought is there. I think we figured that out. If you Google how to run Docker Compose as not root and then do that, it works. <laughs> All right, uh, fun, fun answers. I do like a good public shaming. Uh, Felix, I saw you first. So recognizing that, that yes, a lot of these devices don't fully emulate how they might forward layer two in particular, but do a lot better at layer three. Uh, any advice on how to hook traffic generators and traffic receivers into this so that you can actually you know, verify packet flow? Not, not like throughput or you know, anything like that naturally, but just are my routing tables actually in that state where I don't have to verify each entry in the routing table, but I can just make sure A reaches Z. I used to regularly do that. I'd spin up actually all the hosts in my data center because I was actually also spinning up Netbox and using that as provisioning, spin up IPAM. So I used to just regularly spin up all the hosts and then end up doing traffic tests to them, be it simple pings or something else. Yeah, you, you can find uh, that part's relatively easy. You can find very small Linux VMs or containers that you can spin up in mass and end up having endpoints there for every real host uh, in, in that environment. So yeah, absolutely. Including if you want to go so far as like MAC addresses actually from the host, gather it from the real network and then push those as the MAC addresses in your lab if you want to go that far. Yeah, so we, we uh, most of our labs have a a Linux endpoint, right? So if we build a Clos Fabric, we attach a bunch of Alpine Linux lightweight uh, containers to that to emulate, uh, emulate the endpoints. And then you can run something like iPerf really easily uh, from one node to the other, right? And there's actually a way that you can specify that in your topology file to run iPerf, uh, you know, run it for start it or run it for X amount of time. But yeah, it's an important part of trying to validate that does multi-home uh, you know, does MC lag work, right? Um, or what am I getting for a traffic flow? Is test route tables, cases, yeah. all yeah. of that, yeah. right? What I, I always ended up using it for essentially making sure something didn't break, right? So I would define essentially a traffic matrix. These hosts need to reach these hosts and then run through. Uh, I had, I, I created an Ansible playbook that was essentially a chaos monkey. Just start randomly failing everything in this environment and make sure that, it, that all those traffic flows still succeeded after various random failures. Yeah. So, uh, there's also, um, oh, it's loud. There's also Ondatra for going through and testing your, um, testing various network or testing uh, inputs onto your network, where if you use KE, it seems like it's a lot like Kubernetes, which I'm gonna ask about in a second. But uh, if you use Ondatra, you can go through and generate traffic and see where it goes out throughout your network. Like KE, it's another Google project for network mm -hmm. emulation. Mm -hmm. 
and it's heavily Go based, so you kind of need to be a developer to interact with it, but that lets you go through and generate the pseudo traffic you need and yep. see if it comes out. Yep. Go with making it oh now Kubernetes thing as opposed <laughs> to the K and E and it's a good it's a good yeah. question. So we actually worked with the Google folks on some of the K and E stuff and, and uh, you can run some of our containers in that environment. Um, I believe, uh, I don't know all the reasons, um, but I can, uh, I, I know if they wanted to make it simpler than what k and &E, I think has some overhead associated with it um, that we wanted to try and abstract away or at least remove so that you had the same container lab experience but just across multiple nodes. Do you know, is it just using VXLANs to do host to host networking? Because we've run into some problems using VXLANs due to some layer two traffic Yes, yeah, a good. Uh, I don't actually know if they've settled on uh, any if they're going to do NCAP um, or if they're going to. Yeah, I'll, I'll check on that for you. But I don't believe I don't believe it's VXLAN related today. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Uh, hi, Pete. Uh, could you throw some more light on the translation layer you wrote for emulating L2 switches? I faced this issue last month trying to emulate a. Uh, you know, Cat 9K 40 gig infrastructure on a CML <laughs> iOS v2, and I faced the exact same issue, right? So what I had to do is write a translation layer um, in a YAML file, and I had to write three basically constructs: remove lines, add lines, and replace lines, and it did the trick for me. Yeah. Were you doing anything different, or this? I mean, yeah. it's a no-brainer, right? There's nothing yeah, you could I, do about I, it. I was essentially just writing something that would do search and replace and vagrant right. files and things like that. There, there was no there's, there's there was no there. elegance to it whatsoever. Yeah. It was a brute force approach. Okay, gotcha. Thank you. All right, let's keep it going. Any more questions? A couple in the back there. Uh, yeah, uh, MJ. Hey, uh, quick question: Is there anything um, to support Open Config, or is that already supported uh, with Container Lab? I think that's an hour-long talk to itself. <laughs> <laughs> yes. So um, I think it's going to be mostly NOS dependent, right? If you're going to talk to the device, so is Open Config would be one of your management APIs for the end endpoints. Is that kind of where you're going, or were you talking about? Using Open Config itself for your container lab definitions. Yeah, using Open Config itself. It's a good question. I, I don't know if that's come up at all. Um, I know we've had a number of folks using Open Config against the end nodes, but I don't know if it's come up as a as a request for using that to to model the the uh, container lab environment itself. Yeah, it's a good question. Uh, we are going into lunch next. Uh, we're going to have a couple more One questions, more but, it's, but it's deliberately long, and we've got a bunch of flip charts out there. So for our long conversations about open config, we've got you covered. Just one more question. Would it be possible to use this tool to generate diagrams for compliance purposes? Yes, I believe so. so it does do some, some diagram generation. Yes, it does. That's built in. Uh, you can generate, um, I think, some SVGs. Um, I don't know if they would be compliance worthy, <laughs> but uh, but it does generate graphs, yes, or uh, diagrams, yeah. All right. Any? Let's maybe do one more, if there is one. Yep. What's your experience with um, approaching legacy change management teams and saying, hey, we've got a way to de-risk your change. Do they then start to incorporate this or do they just say, that's fantastic and continue with their legacy model like you said they've been doing for 20 years? It, so the question really is, how do you convince a uh, Or do you have experience of the back and forth with legacy change management teams that normally run this process? I'd kind of open this up to anybody in the room if they've got experience on, on how to do that. I don't have good answer for you on that. Uh, what I found in trying to sell anybody on that type of journey, right, is you've got to end up basically showing them what's in it for them and quite quickly. Uh, and so handhold him through that. And so that in a case of something like, uh, you know, spinning up a lab, it would be here's a lab. 
here's how we can end up testing all the different cases. Here's how we can test the back out plan. I'm going to make your life easier that we're going to take all the risk in with that. That'd be my suggestion. But if anybody else here in the room wants to chime in. Yeah, I, I would just say. Sorry, I, did, I didn't catch the entire question. Um, I did, yeah, I didn't catch the entire question, but um, code, code talks, right? So, so show instead of tell and like just, if you can get away in your environment, if you can just do it and test and show it's, it works or it doesn't, right? That is way better than trying to convince somebody that isn't already sold, right? All right, I think that's all we've got time for. Let's get a huge round of applause for Pete and Jared, please.